four views on the Revelation, uh, the Kingdom of the Rising Sun, and his most recent book is Why Not Full Preterism. Now, some of these terms you may not be familiar with, but um, these are important subjects with regards to the scriptures, and Steve uh, does a great job of giving different views so that you can then be inspired to study the scriptures for yourself and come to your own conclusion. And every once in a while, Steve does give his strong opinion and perspective on a given subject, but uh, it's most important that we are good Bereans, that we search the scriptures daily to see whether these things are so. So, Steve Gregg also has The Narrow Path, which is a ministry of teaching. It also includes uh, live radio, five days a week nationally on approximately 100 stations across the nation, and recently has been brought on to a local station in Fresno, 1550 KXEX on the AM dial. So if you get a chance to listen in, it will be an opportunity to hear more of Steve. But uh, Steve's a passionate uh, follower of Jesus and uh, husband and father, and uh, he's a joy to listen to, to hear, and to learn from. I've learned more from Steve Gregg than any other human being uh, on the earth now. Of course, Jesus, I've learned more from him, but he's not currently in his earthly ministry. So We're not it, in competition. <laughs> yeah. uh, so anyhow, uh, without any further ado, let's welcome Steve Gregg. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, let's bring this down a little bit. All right. Um, well, uh, last time I was here in May, Dennis and I debated on the subject of the Olivet Discourse, and this time we wanted to come and teach on it. <laughs> Which is interesting because uh, Dennis and I have been acquainted for about 20 years. And um, during that whole 20 years, there are some things that we haven't agreed about, but we've enjoyed lengthy conversations both on the air and in person and as recently as a half hour ago at the uh, dinner table. But that's, um, we, we're, we're the kind of people who both kind of like that sort of thing. <clears throat> Discussing the scriptures, even arguing points of view. Why don't we take a moment and I'll, I'm gonna just pray and we'll get into our subject tonight. Thank you, Father, for this uh, opportunity to meet with the members of the body of Christ who would make a priority of coming out on a Friday night to study uh, your word and a subject like this. I pray that you'll bless each one here with a greater understanding and greater appreciation for Jesus and his, his credential as not only the Messiah, but also as a prophet par excellence I pray, Father, that he will uh, just reveal himself to us tonight more and that his words become clearer to us than they've ever become in the past as your Holy Spirit continues to guide us into all truth. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I don't think I need this microphone. Okay. I can talk loudly enough, and I think that that's probably, it's kind of echoey to have that. And I need both hands free. So we're uh, good. All go. those are good reasons to not have that microphone, I think. The All of the Discourse is a very uh, much discussed, controversial passage. Although many people perhaps don't know it's controversial, they've heard it taught from one point of view and have never known that it, there were other points of view about it. That was my position for many years in my ministry. I've been in the ministry for 50 years, 52 years, actually, this year, as a Bible teacher. And for the first 12 of those years, probably, or more, the Olivet Discourse just had a certain meaning that my teachers told me it meant. I kind of read it through this grid, and I never thought there'd be any reason to consider another way of looking at it. And then I read a book uh, back in the 80s by a guy named Jay Adams. And he had written a book actually about Revelation where he was taking the view that Revelation is actually fulfilled in the past, not in the future. 
And he also had a chapter in there, as I recall, about the Olivet Discourse. And uh, he didn't convince me about Revelation in that book, but what he said about the Olivet Discourse was very eye-opening. Now, that's the first I ever heard of such alternatives. I later ran into other authors and, and people and, who got me thinking. One of the biggest problems I had was uh, I couldn't imagine that anything in this had been already had occurred because I thought it was saying something that I now don't think it is saying. And that's, so that's the job of a Bible teacher is try to unpack what something says and what it means. Now, this is the famous discourse where Jesus talks about there'll be wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes and famines and pestilences in diverse places, uh, the abomination of desolation, that, all that stuff. But most, most Christians who are biblically literate know what I'm talking about when I say that. That discourse is found in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. It's found in the 13th chapter of Mark. It's found in the 21st chapter of Luke. And it's found in Matthew 24. And I would say 24 and 25 because 24 and 25 of Matthew are very long. It, makes, it appears to be the same discourse. Although in Matthew, it's three times longer than it is in Mark or in Luke. Now, I'm going to use Matthew here because I believe the reason that Matthew's version of the Olive Discourse appears to be three times longer is because he brings in things that Jesus said on other occasions, which the other Gospels don't include. No two of the Gospels, even when they're talking about the same story of the same discourse, will give exactly the same details of it whether it's one of the famous miracles of Jesus or one of the parables of Jesus or whether it's a discourse like this, whether it's the Sermon on the Mount or some other passage, uh, if two or more Gospels cover it, they don't cover it verbatim the same. They, they, there's some different wording. There's some different details included or excluded. Part of that is simply because they're histories. And when people write history, they have to decide what they're going to include, what they're not. There's often the need to abbreviate. But... I will say this about Matthew. There are five major discourses in the Gospel of Matthew. And one of them is the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through 7. Uh, the next one is this, the discourse he gave to his disciples, the 12, when he sent them out two by two in Matthew chapter 10. And then in Matthew 13, there's the parables discourse, which has seven or eight, depending on how you count them, parables of Jesus all in one chapter, chapter 13. And then there's uh, chapter 18, which is a, a chapter about uh, forgiveness and relationships. And then there's the all of the discourse in chapters 24 and 25. You had a question? I'm sorry. I have no idea what all of the discourse means. Okay, uh, you will. Thank oh, you. Okay, that's, that's fine. fine. That's fine. Probably a lot of people here don't. Uh, all of it, it does mean all of it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a word from the word olives. The, the Mount of Olives. The, the discourse was given on the Mount of Olives. Theologians gave it the title, the Olive that discourse. Uh, by, discourse is a talk? A sermon, no. A sermon. Mm -hmm. Or a talk, a uh, discourse. So this is a discourse that Jesus gave on the Mount of Olives, and theologians have always called it the Olivet Discourse. Uh, I, I don't blame anyone for not knowing that term. If you have been raised around people who talk about it. I, I've been around people who talk about it so much that I, I forget that that's a term that certainly a lot of people wouldn't know. But what I was saying about the five major discourses of Jesus in Matthew, all five of them appear to be composite discourses. For example, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew is three chapters long. It has parallels to a similar sermon, if not the same one, in Luke 6. But in Luke 6, it's only half a chapter long. It begins similarly and it ends similarly. It has much of the same in between, but in Luke 6, it's just a half a chapter. In Matthew, it's, it's uh, three chapters. Now, that's because Matthew apparently not only gives that discourse, but brings in material that we find in Luke and Mark and other places on relevant subjects and brings them together to make one composite large discourse. And when Jesus sends out the 12 in, John, in Matthew 10, the first part, little part of that, is parallel 
to discourses in Luke 9 and 10 where Jesus is sending out the disciples. But then the later part of chapter 10 talks about subject matter way off into the future. For example, when he sent out the 12, he said, don't go to the way of the Gentiles, just go to the Jews, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But before he's done with that discourse in Matthew, he's added things like, you're going to be, all nations are going to hate you. You'll be brought before synagogues and, and, and courts and rulers, and, and you'll be a witness to the Gentiles and, and so forth. In other words, when he sent them out, he gave these instructions about this short-term outreach that was just going to be in Israel. But when Matthew gives it, he includes things Jesus said on other occasions that have to do with their later ministry, too, and it just puts it all in one chapter. This is what is usually referred to as a topical arrangement of the material. Um, now, when we come to the Olivet Discourse, it's about three times as long in Matthew as it is in Luke or Mark. But that's because I believe, now not everyone agrees with this, this is what we'll discuss, I believe there are two different discourses, and maybe three that are combined here. The reason I say maybe three is because the first part of Matthew 24 parallels very, very closely the all of the discourse in Mark 13 and Luke 21. But then in Matthew 24, after about verse 35 or so, there's parallels to a different discourse in Luke 17. The material in Matthew 24, verses 36 and following, is not found in Mark or Luke's all of the discourse, but it is found, much of it is found, in Luke 17, a different discourse given by Jesus on a different occasion, not on the Mount of Olives. So technically, it's not really part of the all of the discourse, apparently. Then you've got Matthew 25, which just continues. That's three parables that Jesus gives that aren't found in any other place in the Bible. So those must have been from some other source that Matthew had. Of course, Matthew was an eyewitness, so he would, her, would have heard those himself. He may have been his own source. But the point is, Matthew's all of the discourse is, comes from at least three different sources. Uh, one is uh, the source from the all of the discourse itself, recorded in Mark and Luke. Another is a different discourse of Jesus given in Luke 17. And another is three parables that we don't know where Matthew got them, but he, he heard them with his own ears, so he may be his own source. Now, having said that, the question that is at issue is, what is the Olive Discourse about? That, that is the portion that was on the Mount of Olives uttered, which parallels Mark 13 and Luke 21. Second question, what is the discourse in Luke 17 about, which is brought by Matthew into and attached to the Olive Discourse? What is that about? And then I guess the third one would be you know, these parables. What are they about? What the, I think they, uh, that won't be the biggest difficulty for us tonight. Let me just read. This is a night where having your Bible with you would be very helpful. I'd, you didn't have any advance notice, so if you didn't bring it, I hope you're a good listener. But it's, uh, it's very advantageous to be able to read along here. In Matthew 24, it says, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. <clears throat> and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, as he said on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Or birth pangs is another possible translation of that word, sorrows. Like a woman's labor pains. Verse 9, then they will deliver you up to tribulation, to kill you. And you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended 
will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I've told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms. Do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branches, when its branch has already become tender, and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near, at the doors. Assured, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed the, his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Now, beyond this point, the material is not found in either Mark or Luke. And up to this point, we've already encountered material that's from two different places in Luke. Luke 21, his version of the Olivet Discourse, which is also Mark 13, and the first, basically, 36 verses of this chapter. And then after that, the material we read has its closest parallel in Luke 17, a different discourse which may be on a different subject. But what is the first part about? Let's talk about that first. I was uh, raised, as probably many of you were, to understand this is a passage about the end of the world before Jesus returns. Things that maybe, maybe they're even starting to happen as we speak. Earthquakes, 
wars, rumors of wars, pestilences. Now, I, I have to say that these things were associated in my mind with the end times, the last days. Some of them with what was called the tribulation period. And so it was very common for those who were looking for signs of the times to be saying, oh, look how many wars there are. Look how many earthquakes there are. Look how many of these things are happening. I remember a number of teachers saying, you know, there have been more earthquakes in the last hundred years than in all recorded history previously. Now, I'm not sure how anyone would know that. I don't know if they could re record worldwide earthquakes 100 years ago and beyond. So I don't know how anyone knows how many earthquakes there were previously, but even if it was true, they're, they're quoting that as if to say, see, we're living in the times Jesus described here. There will be earthquakes. I'd point out that he doesn't say anything about there being an increased number of earthquakes. He just said, there's going to be earthquakes, there's going to be wars, there's going to be pestilences. Has there ever been a time when there weren't those things? He didn't say they're going to increase. He said, don't let these things make you think that the end is near. It's not the end. These things have to happen, but it's not the end. In other words, far from saying earthquakes and pestilences, wars, these are a sign of the times. saying, no, don't think they are. They're not. These are just things that have to happen, but the end's not yet. After all, there's always those things. There's a lot of calamities that might make you think the end of the world is near, but don't be making that mistake, is what he says. But what is he talking about? Is he talking about the end of the world? Well, I don't think he is. But to see that he's not, one has to look carefully at the parallel passages as well. But let's look at this passage. First of all, he left the temple with his disciples. And they observed how magnificent the stones of the temple were. They are pointing it out. Look at these great stones. And they were great stones. I mean, Josephus... And um, other authorities say that those stones were huge, enormous, fantastic. Was, you know, the temple was one of the great wonders of the world. <clears throat> and the disciples were impressed with it. Why did they point out the stones? They'd seen them many times before. It's possibly because Jesus had just said, your house has left you desolate. That is, he told the Jews that their house, the temple, not God's house, earlier in his ministry, it was my father's house. Remember when he said, don't make my father's house a house of merchandise. That was the temple. He's no longer calling it his father's house. The Jews have rejected Jesus. He's going to be crucified within days. And he no longer calls it my father's house. He says, your house. This is yours. It's all yours. God doesn't own it anymore. Your house is empty, desolate. It's abandoned. Now, it may be because of that statement that the disciples said, but Lord, look at these stones. How, why would God ever abandon this beautiful house? And his answer was, well, do you see that? I'll tell you, the day is coming when not one of these stones will be left standing on another. They're all going to be thrown down. Now, you may know enough about first century history, you might not, to realize that that actually happened. The Romans attacked Israel and was, were in a bloody war with the Israelites for three and a half years, beginning in 66 AD and, and ending in 70 AD. And in AD 70, the temple was destroyed and burned by the Romans. Every stone was taken down. What Jesus predicted came true in the year 70 AD. Okay? That's just history. The Bible doesn't record it. History records it. It's known to be a fact. Now, we find that the disciples come to him, and they have a couple of questions for him. Two or three. This is where it gets a little tricky. In verse 3, he said, as he said on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? That's the first question. And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, when will these things be? He must refer to what he predicted. They wouldn't just say these things without some kind of a reference, without some kind of an uh, antecedent. He had just said the temples will be destroyed, leveled. Not one stone to be left on another. And when they said, when will these things be? The only way to understand their question would be, when is the temple going to be leveled, like you just said? When will this be? But they asked another question. In Matthew, it's rendered like this. And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? 
Now here's where, looking at the parallels in Mark and in Luke, could be instructive. The same story is in Mark 13. <clears throat> in verses 1 and 2, the same things we've just looked at. He walks out of the temple. Disciples comment on the stones. He predicts they're going to be thrown down. In verse 3, it says, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately. Now Matthew just said his disciples. Here we're given, put a finer point. Well, not all his disciples. Four of his disciples came to him privately and asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be? Okay, that's the same first question we found in Matthew 24.3. But then their second question is worded differently. And what will be the sign? Now, so far, that's the same. Because in Matthew 24, they said, when will these things be and what will be the sign? But then in Matthew, it says, the sign of your coming in the end of the age here it has what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled. So you have the expression these things in both places. When will these things, the destruction of the temple, be? And what sign will there be that these things, the destruction of the temple, will be soon fulfilled? They want a general time frame and they want some kind of warning sign. And it's interesting that in Mark, they ask the same, well, they ask about the same subject. Two questions about the same subject. When will it be? Okay, give us some kind of a time frame here. And what sign might we look for to know that it's coming soon? He goes on after that the same way Matthew 24 does. But if you look over at Luke 21, we have the same story. And it's in verse uh, 6 that he makes the prediction about the stones being destroyed or thrown down. And in verse 7, so they asked him, saying, Teacher, but when will these things be? So far, all three Gospels agree on that first question. And what sign will there be? So far, all three agree on those words, too. What sign will there be when these things are about to take place? Now, that sounds like Mark. Because those are the same two questions that Mark has them asking. When will these things be? What sign will there be when these things are about to take place? Now, the term these things, obviously, are referring to what he had predicted. Now, if you'll look at Matthew 24 again, then. In verse 34, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things come to pass. Now they said, when will these things be? His answer was, this generation will not pass before these things be, before these things happen. He's answering their question directly. They asked for a time frame. He gave them one. Now, when I was younger and I thought that this was not talking about things that happened in the first century, and I thought these were things still unfulfilled in our future. I figured that when he said this generation will not pass, he didn't really mean that that generation would not pass, his own generation. My teachers actually told me that what he meant was the generation that begins to see these things start happening will not pass until it all happens. So he's not really giving them an answer to the question, when shall these things be? He's not telling them when they'll be. He's just saying... When it, when it starts to happen, whenever that might be, it'll happen within a span of a generation. But if that's what he meant, and he was talking about some future generation, one might think that he would say, that generation will not pass, rather than this generation will not pass. Especially in view of the fact that about five other times in Matthew previous to this, he's used the expression, this generation. And as far as I know, in each case, he was talking about his own contemporaries like I'd be talking about this generation, the people living at this one time. If I say this generation, or our generation, or uh, talking about my generation, it's, many of you are not old enough to know that song. But this generation, in all the other occurrences in Matthew, when that phrase is used, refers to 
the generation that saw John the Baptist and saw Jesus and rejected them both and said, John the Baptist, he's got a demon, and Jesus is a wine bibber and a glutton, a friend of sinners. Jesus, that's, that's what this generation is saying. Uh, and there's, and there's, you know, you can look at the places when he said all these things in, in Matthew 23. He said all the, all the blood guilt of all the righteous blood that was shed is going to come on this generation. Um, and he also said uh, in another place, in chapter 12, he said that what, to what shall I liken this generation? It's, uh, he said it's like, well, he said it's, it's, a man, it's like a man had a demon cast out and seven worse demons came in. So shall it be with this wicked generation. He had come to that generation He'd cast out their demons. He'd given them, brought salvation, but they didn't receive him. And 70, you know, seven worse demons came in. The nation became totally attacked by demons and Romans. If you read Josephus' account, you'll see that both were involved. Now, there's another view, and that is that the word Ganea, generation, really doesn't mean a generation like we use that term, but it means a progeny or a family or a race. Now, actually, the term can use, it can mean that. In certain contexts, it is possible for uh, the word gen generation to mean a race or a people. When I was younger, I encountered people who argued that he means the race of the Jews will not pass away until all these things are done. So he would be saying then, uh, these things are going to happen thousands of years off in the future, but the race of the Jews will still be around. However, I don't know why he would say this generation, I mean, the Jewish race will still be around because no one asked him about that. He, they asked him some specific questions. Presumably, he's seeking to give them an answer. The question was, when will this be? If he says, well, this race will still be around, well, he's dodged the question and answered a question nobody was curious about. But if he's saying, this generation, people living right now, will not pass away, until all these things are fulfilled, then he is answering their question. What is the time frame for this? Now, more than that, Matthew, when he's not using the expression this generation, still uses the word generation. Like in Matthew chapter 1, he talks about there were 14 generations from Abraham to David. And there were 14 generations from David to the carrying away into captivity under Jeconiah. And there were 14 generations from that time to Joseph, the, the, the husband of Mary. Now, the word generations there is not talking about races. There weren't, there weren't 14 races and then 14 races and then 14 races. He's talking about generations the way we use the term. And he expects his audience to know that. So when he says this generation will not pass, all the data in the book of Matthew would suggest he means the people living at that time. More than that, he had made another very similar statement earlier than this. In Matthew 16. And there he said in verse 28, Assuredly I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, if there's some people standing there in his day who would not see death before they see this, that's the same thing as saying this generation will not pass away. Some people living in this generation will not yet be dead. So there's every reason to believe that Jesus is indeed giving a time frame when he says this generation will not pass. But the other question, and it did happen, by the way, 40 years later, how could it be more precise? He's, he made the prediction in 30 AD. It was absolutely fulfilled in 70 AD, 40 years later. If he is saying that that generation would live to see the destruction of the temple, it is the most specific and accurate prophecy we have on record of Jesus ever making of uh, something that didn't ful wasn't fulfilled in his own lifetime, but happened in the very time frame he said. So I'm, I'm of the opinion that when Jesus said, this generation will not pass till all these things are fulfilled, that he was talking about what they asked him about, which is a nice thing to do. It's a pol polite thing to do. If someone asks you a question, you go off at length for... 35 verses, it's nice that you take a moment at least to address the question they asked you about. But what was the second question? 
Now, in Mark and Luke, the second question is rendered, and what sign shall there be that these things are about to take place? Certainly no, no evidence that these things in the second question are different than these things in the first question. They only have one thing on their mind. Jesus, by the way, had not mentioned to them <clears throat> the end of the world. He only mentioned that the temple would be destroyed, not one stone be left or standing on another. They have no, they don't have any prediction from him about the end of the world here. So in Mark and Luke, they have him saying, the, the disciples saying, what shall be the sign that these things are about to take place? And if that is what they're asking, he actually answers that too. Because he says, in verse 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee the mountains, let him who is on the house up, you know, not go down. Uh, now, he says, there is a sign you can look for. It is the sign uh, of the abomination of desolation. We have that same expression used in Mark 13 in the parallel. And this expression, uh, the abomination of desolation, is clearly taken from Daniel, as Jesus says in, in Mark 13, 14. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Why? Because the very danger that's going to cause the temple to be dismantled is going to be dangerous for everybody in Judea. So when you see this, get out of there. I'm giving you some sign that you will see that this is about to take place. Now you'll notice that both Matthew and Mark have it. When you see the abomination of desolation, and then in parentheses it says, let him who reads understand. Like, okay, it may be that the reader might have trouble understanding this, but this is what Jesus said. I hope you'll understand what he's talking about here. Well, abomination of desolation is a very Hebraic statement from Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Luke was writing to a Greek man who probably had no familiarity with Daniel. And Luke, when he comes to the very same place in the narrative, changes it. I would say interprets it or paraphrases it because Luke knew what he meant. I believe Matthew and Mark knew what he meant too, but Matthew and Mark didn't, weren't sure their audience would know what he meant because they'd say in parentheses, let him who reads understand. Like, maybe you won't. This is hard to understand what I'm talking about. Daniel spoke of the abomination of desolation. Hope you can understand. Well, Luke just assumed his reader, Theophilus, a Greek guy, wouldn't understand. So instead of saying that, he just kind of paraphrased it so that he could understand and you find that in Luke 21, in verse 20. This is the very point in the discourse where Mark and Matthew say, when you see the abomination of desolation, in Luke 21, 20, it says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near then flee to the mountains, he says. Just like Matthew and Mark said to flee the mountains when you see the abomination of desolation. In Luke, it says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, its desolation is near. This is the abomination that's going to bring about its desolation. And it's time for you to flee. Now, you see then, if the disciples ask two questions about the destruction of the temple, which they apparently did, if you only had Mark and, and Luke and never seen Matthew, you'd never dream otherwise. They ask, when will it be? The answer is, in this generation. The second question, what sign will there be that it's about to happen? Well, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, or what Daniel called the abomination of desolation, then you know it's near. So both questions are answered very directly in the discourse. Now, Daniel used the term abomination of desolation in three different places, but the place Jesus is referring to particularly, I think, is Daniel 9, 27, because in Daniel 9, 26 and 27, it says that the Messiah is going to be killed and then the people of the prince who is to come is going to come and destroy the city, Jerusalem, and the sanctuary, the temple. So Dan and, and the next verse refers to that as the abomination that causes desolation. So what do we have? In Matthew 24, we have a prediction of the destruction of the temple, the disciples asking a question, Jesus answering the question. 
In Mark and Luke, they have two questions, and we find Jesus answering both. But in Matthew, their second question is reworded. In Matthew 24, 3, their questions are said to be this. Tell us when shall these things be? Okay, all the Gospels agree about that question. And what will be the sign? Now, at this point, all the Gospels agree also. They said, what shall be the sign? But in the other Gospels, what shall be the sign that these things are about to happen? But in Matthew, it reads, what shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Now, the King James Version actually says, of your coming and the end of the world. Well, no wonder people have read this chat passage and think it's about the end of the world. But Jesus had not predicted the end of the world. Only the end of the temple, which was the end of the Jewish age, or what we call the Second Temple Era. <clears throat> the, the disciples and all their ancestors for the previous 1,400 years had lived in the age of the law, the age of the Mosaic Covenant, which was dominated by the, first the tabernacle, later the temple. The destruction of the temple was the end of that era. And the end of the era meant that's the end of the age, uh, the age that they were living in and the age that they'd always lived in and their ancestors had too. But what, what is the sign of your coming? Now you can see, when we think of the second coming of Christ, we immediately think of his second coming at the literal end of the world. Now they didn't say the end of the world. They said the, the end of the ion, which is age. Um, so the King James was a little confusing by translating the end of the world because they probably were not thinking of the end of the world. Or maybe they were. Maybe they thought the destruction of the temple, since they knew nothing about beyond that, maybe they thought that'd be the end of the world. Maybe they did. I, I can't say what they thought or didn't think. But according to Mark and Luke, they weren't asking about really the end of the world, but about the destruction of the temple specifically. Now, what is the sign of your coming and the end of the age? The word coming... The word parousia, which is in the Greek, the term often used for the second coming of Christ, is also a word that's used many times in the Greek for things that are not the second coming of Christ. Um, remember, the disciples at this point didn't even know yet that Jesus was leaving, much less coming back. When we hear of Jesus coming, we're hearing it from the framework of he's been gone a long time, and we want him back. Can't wait till Jesus comes because he's not here and we want him to be here. But when he spoke these words, he was there. As far as they knew, the next thing he's going to do is go set up his kingdom in Jerusalem. They didn't know he'd be crucified. You might say, well, he told him, didn't he? Yeah, but their ears were dull of hearing. They didn't understand what he said. When he got crucified, it blew their minds. They were totally unexpected, even unexpected of his resurrection. Even after he was resurrected and people told him he was resurrected, they still didn't believe it. Even though Jesus had predicted several times, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise again on the third day, they just didn't register. If they asked what would be the sign of your coming, it's very unlikely that they were thinking in terms of what we call the second coming of Christ because they didn't know there was going to be a second coming. They didn't know there was going to be a going away. I think it took them by surprise when he was caught up in Acts chapter 1 and a cloud received him out of their sight, and two angels had to say to him, well, he's going to come back. Why are you looking at him? This same Jesus that you saw go up, he's going to come back in the same way. That was probably the first time they realized there's actually going to be a second coming, because until he died and disappeared into the clouds, they thought he's already here. He was, but he went away. They did not have... When Jesus gave this discourse, they did not have in their minds a frame of reference of what we call the second coming yet, because he was still there the first time. And for all they knew, he would be perpetually. So why would they use that term, your coming? Because, remember we saw just a moment ago in Matthew 16, 28, some of you standing here will not taste death until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, Jesus could be said to come in more ways than one. Remember in Revelation, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. Okay, so that's like different than his second coming. In the book of Revelation, the seven letters to the seven churches, 
each of the seven churches are told that, well, not each of them, but about four or five of them are told that they need to watch out because Jesus is going to come to them and fight with them with the sword out of his mouth, or he's going to come and remove their lampstand from its place or something like that. Most of those things he threatened already happened centuries ago now. Those cities aren't even there anymore. Uh, those churches are not there anymore. It's not going to happen in the future. But more than that, the idea of God coming was a commonplace bit of language <clears throat> in the Old Testament prophets. And Jesus spoke like an Old Testament prophet for good reason. His disciples knew about the prophets. They'd heard them read all their lives in the synagogue. One of those prophets was Isaiah. In Isaiah 19, <clears throat> verse 1, we read this. The burden against Egypt. Behold, the Lord rides on a swift cloud and will come into Egypt. Now, this is Yahweh, the Lord God. He's riding on a cloud and he's going to come into Egypt. Now, that sounds like we expect Jesus to come here on the clouds at his second coming, but this is not talking about the second coming. It's not even talking about a literal coming at all. As you read on, you see in the prophecy, this is about uh, the fall of Egypt to the Assyrians. The Assyrians conquered them in the 8th century BC. And, and this is predicting that. The Assyrian armies are God coming because God is bringing them. God is judging Egypt using the Assyrian armies as his tool or as his weapon. In Isaiah 10, he used uh, the Assyrians also to destroy the northern kingdom of Israel. And he referred to them as his weapon, or his, his tool. He said the Assyrians, they, they give themselves the credit for it. He said, but can the saw boast against him who saws with it? Can the axe boast against one who's cutting with it? In other words, God's using Assyria as a tool to bring his judgment on, in that case, Samaria. In this case, Egypt. But when God does that, the armies coming at the behest of God are often spoken in the poetic language of the prophets. And this is poetic as God himself coming. It's not uncommon in the prophets. Yeah, another great example would be also, uh, <clears throat> this time is about the Assyrians coming, as near as I can tell, against uh, Jerusalem in Micah chapter 1. <clears throat> it says in Micah 1.3, For behold, Yahweh is coming out of his place. He will come down and tread on the high places of the land. Now, this is referring to the Assyrians coming and wasting Judea, as they had done the northern kingdom of Israel. This is, it's the Lord coming out of his place. It's really armies from Assyria coming, but God is sending them. God is bringing them sovereignly against them. It's his judgment. So in the poetry of the prophets, it's God coming against them. I believe also that's what we have in Zechariah chapter 14. Probably people will have trouble with this more than maybe the other two passages because this is a favorite passage that many people use about the second coming. But in Zechariah 14, it talks about the destruction of Jerusalem, I believe, in AD 70. It says, Behold, the day is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst. I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. That was uh, the Roman armies were all the nations that had been conquered by Rome and now were part of their armies, the whole empire, to battle against Jerusalem. This city shall be taken. That's Jerusalem. It'll be taken. Oh, there it is again. It gets destroyed. The women are ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Now, when it says the remnant of the people will not be cut off, they, they won't go into captivity because it's, it doesn't say half. It says the remnant. Half of them will go into captivity. Another almost half of them were wiped out by the Romans. But the remnant, which was the believers in Jerusalem, the Jewish church, they escaped and they remain citizens of the true Jerusalem. They have not been cut off from the city. All the Jews who rejected Christ were cut off, either went into captivity or were slaughtered in 70 AD. The Christians fled and got away and continue to be the citizens of Zion. They are not cut off from it. It says that in Hebrews chapter 12, that we Christians, we have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the city of God. 
the, when she goes on to say, the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. The, the new Jerusalem is the, the spiritual Jerusalem, the church in Hebrews chapter 12. And that's what Paul means also in Galatians 4 when he says the Jerusalem that is above is free, which is the mother of us all. He means the church is the mother of us, all God's children. So the point is, the next verse says in Zechariah 14.3, then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations. Now, this speaks of his going forth, not against Jerusalem, but against, apparently, the nations. Unless those nations is a reference to the, uh, you know, northern and southern kingdom, which weren't actually separate nations at this time, but they had been. But, it, but the Lord going forth is the same language you have in Isaiah and Micah and other places where God comes. He goes forth, he goes out and fights, he's, he's doing those things. Now, that's why I think when Jesus said, some of you standing here will not taste death until you see the Son of Man coming. I believe he's probably referring to the Roman armies coming against Jerusalem because Jesus predicted several times that that was gonna happen. In Luke chapter 19, he wept over the city of Jerusalem and said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if, if only you had known in this your day the things that pertain to your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. For the days are coming when your enemies will lay a siege mound against you and surround you round about, and they will lay you to the ground and your children within you, and not one stone will be left standing on another. Same prediction he made about the temple. In Luke 19, he made about the city. Jesus, in the end of his ministry, made a lot of references to the destruction of Jerusalem, I believe. And that was what would happen in those days. But in the Jewish prophetic verbiage, that would be uh, him coming, just like Yahweh came on clouds against Egypt, but it was really the Assyrian armies. Now, I do believe in a future second coming, but what I'm saying is that when the disciples said, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of this age, I believe that Mark and Luke have paraphrased what they said because they used Jewish idioms. Matthew's the only gospel written to a Jewish audience. He retains Jewish idioms that Jesus used more than any other gospel does. Mark, a little less so. Luke, much less so. If the disciples said, what is the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And Mark and Luke say, what they meant was, what are the signs that these things are about to happen? Then Mark and Luke are interpreting this second question as being about AD 70. And the answer to it is, well, <clears throat> when will it be? In this generation, it'll be in this generation. What sign will there be? When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, that's the sign. You better get out of town. That's the abomination that makes desolate, that Daniel spoke of. Now, you might say, but did those things happen before 70 AD? Earthquakes, yes. Wars, rumors of wars, yes. Pestilences, famines, lots of them. Now, Jesus didn't say there'd be an increased number of them, but there actually were a great number of them. Some of them are recorded in the Bible itself, in the book of Acts. Some of them are recorded by the Roman historians of the time. Some are mentioned by Josephus, the Jewish historian who was there, who was actually in Jerusalem during the war or outside at some of the time. The historians of the period record there are lots of earthquakes, lots of pestilences, lots of civil wars, lots, and even in diverse places, even in Rome, Nero committed suicide in 68. In the next 18 months, there were four emperors because they killed each other off. There, Rome was filled with civil war after Nero died, and lots of people wanted his job. One guy named Galba was the first one to lift himself up a general, made himself emperor. He was killed off in three months. The next one was Otho. He didn't last much longer, a few months. Next guy's name was Vicellus. He didn't last long either. Um, and eventually the thing was settled when the Senate elected uh, a permanent replacement for Nero. But at all that time, the, the city of Rome was in uproar. If you read the Roman history, the rise and fall of the uh, Roman Empire, you find that historians say it's amazing Rome survived that turmoil because there was just chaos and war. So the disciples in Jerusalem, they were hearing of wars in faraway places, kingdoms rising up against kingdom, and 
those kind of things. All those things did happen. But there's a part of it that some people think probably didn't happen. And that's in Matthew 24, verse 29 through uh, 31. Let me read this section. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the heavens and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from before winds from one end of heaven to the other. The imagery in that statement immediately strikes us as the future, end of the world, second coming of Christ. Sends his angels to gather his people in. They see him in the clouds. Cosmic disturbances, sun and moon, stars, going dark. Did those things literally happen? Uh, some of them amazingly did, but not all of them happened, literally. The ones that did not happened in the sense that the prophets used that terminology. We as American Christians, unless, unless you study the prophets a lot, are not that familiar with the prophetic language. But let me show you something Isaiah said. In Isaiah 13, he's, he's prophesying the fall of the Babylonian Empire to the Medes and the Persians. This happened in 539 BC. He, he names the Medes in particular as being involved in this, but the Medes and the Persians together were. And as it talks about the destruction of Babylon, it says in verse 10, Isaiah 13, 10, for the stars of the heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened and it's going forth. The moon will not cause its light to shine. Well, that didn't all literally happen when Babylon fell to the Medes and the Persians, but it was kind of the end of the world for them, but it's just poetic language. If you turn to Isaiah 32, There's another prophecy, or maybe it's 34. Let me check it out here just to make sure. I think it's 34, actually. There's a, a prophecy against Edom. Now, Edom isn't a nation anymore. The last Edomite that history knows of was Herod the Great. The Edomites were enemies of the Jews in Old Testament history, but they were taken into Babylon three years after Jerusalem was. Jerusalem went into Babylon in 586 B.C., Three years later, in 583 B.C., the Edomites were taken into captivity into Babylon too. They never recovered. Some of them came back or just remained in the land, but they were uh, subsumed in the uh, intertestamental period into southern Judah and put under Jewish law by force, so they ceased to be a nation anymore. And the last of them that's known to have been existence was Herod. They're, this is an extinct nation. But this predicts the destruction of Edom. And it says this in Isaiah 34, 4. All the host of heaven, meaning the stars, shall be dissolved. The heavens shall be rolled up like a scroll. All their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falls from the vine and its fruit falling from a fig tree. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Indeed, it shall come down on Edom and the people of my curse. For judgment, the sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made overflowing with fatness, with the blood of lambs and goats, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It says, um, "Well, I don't need to read on anymore." We can see that he's talking about the destruction of Edom. Bozrah was the capital of Edom. He's talking about something that happened almost 600 years before Christ. He describes it as the host of heaven being dissolved, the heavens being rolled up like a scroll. All the hosts shall fall down as the leaf falls from the vine. That is, all the stars will fall like a leaf uh, falls from the vine. And so 
what we have here is, of course, the language of, of, of a cataclysm, to be sure, but not literal. This is the way the prophets talk when something very, very bad permanently happens to a nation. That's how they talk about it. Now, Jesus said those things will happen, too, in that generation. Did they literally happen? Well, not exactly. But they happen in the same sense that they happen in Isaiah 19, or Isaiah 13, or Isaiah 34, or in some of the other passages that use this language. We didn't look at Ezekiel 32, which talks about the same thing when Egypt fell to the Babylonians. It talks about how the sun and the moon and stars were darkened. Um, and there's other places like that. So what we have is when Jesus said, after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the heaven. Everything there is language from Isaiah or some other prophetic passage, which in their original context referred to the destruction of some nation of some kind. This, in this case, it apparently is Jerusalem and the Jewish nation. It says, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Now, what is the sign of the Son of Man? Because it's spoken of separately than him coming, because a few uh, lines later it says, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. It says, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the land will mourn. The word earth can be translated land. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven in power and great glory. <clears throat> now, the sign of the Son of Man in heaven is, is a term used only here. We don't, we don't have any other passage to clarify what it means. But one possible meaning is it's a sign that the Son of Man is, in fact, in heaven. The reason I say that is because to the Jews, the Son of Man in heaven calls to mind Daniel, chapter 7, verse uh, 12 and 13, I think it is, where he says, I saw one like the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, and he came to the Ancient of Days. So he's going up. He's going up to God. It's the ascension of Christ from the Mount of Olives is what's referred to. Son of Man, Daniel's on the other side. He sees the heavenly throne. He sees the Son of Man coming up through the clouds. The disciples saw him disappear into the clouds. Daniel's on the other side. He sees him come up through the clouds to the ancient days. He's given a throne as Jesus sat down at the right hand of God when he ascended. The coming of the Son of Man is an expression that comes from that verse, first of all. And so he could be saying, you'll see the sign that the Son of Man has, in fact, come in that sense. You'll see it. Now, one argument that has been made is that the very fact that the temple was destroyed and the Jewish system that crucified Christ will be the sign that God has vindicated him, that Jesus is reigning now. He's not on the cross anymore. He's not their victim. He's their judge as he sits at the throne, at the reign of God. It's not clear entirely what this refers to the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. When it says the tribes of the earth, again, the word earth is, in, in the Greek, it's the word gay, which means earth or land. Usually it's Israel that's divided into tribes, not the planet. The planet is usually divided into nations. Israel's divided into tribes. So to say the tribes of the land will mourn makes plenty of sense, especially since it's a term that comes from Zechariah 12.10, which talks about all the inhabitants of Jerusalem mourning and uh, seems to be a reference to that. So it's, it's the people of Israel in the land of Israel that are mourning because of this. And they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Well, Egypt saw God coming on the clouds of heaven, but not literally. They saw the Assyrians coming. That was God coming on the clouds. If, if Israel saw the Romans coming, and that was Jesus sending them, like Isaiah talks about. Then they saw that in the Romans. But then there's this. Verse 31, he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. And they'll gather together his elect from the four winds, that is the four compass points, from one end of heaven to the other. That is from one horizon to the other horizon. Where is he gathering them to? And who are these angels that are gathering them? The word angeloi, which is translated angels, is the 
word in, in Greek that generally means messengers. In the Bible, it often means special messengers sent from God from heaven. Uh, and we, we, that's what the word angel, when we find angel in the New Testament, usually we're thinking of a supernatural angel. It is a, a translation of angelos. But, but the same word is the ordinary word for a messenger, a human messenger. John the Baptist sent two messengers from prison to ask Jesus, are you the one who's to come or not? Luke refers to those two messengers as angeloi. Many times, like uh, in, in James, it talks about how Rahab received the messengers and sent them away safely. Angeloi is the word used. Human messengers are called angeloi too. What if we just translate this as the Greek allows? He'll send out his messengers, the apostles, the evangelists, the missionaries, and they'll gather his elect into his body into the church. It's not it doesn't say they're going to go away to another planet. The, after Jerusalem falls, the gospel is no longer focused on the Jews. It's now an international message. The messengers of the gospel go out and they gather his elect from all the parts of the world, which has been what's been going on for the last 2,000 years. Now, I've, all I've tried to do is show you that everything Jesus said here has parallels, in many cases, multiple parallels, in the Old Testament that, that use the same language, the same imagery, and are not talking about the end of the world or a literal second coming of Christ. Yes, Dennis. I'm wondering if we could, uh, if you want to just make another point or two, or maybe we could open up to questions, and then if um, there's not you know, several questions, if we could go back and go from mm -hmm. the Yes, let me say only one more thing. And that is, I've only dealt with that first part of the discourse. I'm not going to deal in, de in detail with the other part. But the part that parallels Luke 17 is the part that talks about the days of Noah and the one should be taken and the other left, which people all have associated with <coughs> the second coming usually. But I think in Luke 17, it's not talking about that. Uh, well, I mean, I believe it is talking about that, but I don't think it's part of the same subject as the earlier. Because he says at the end of this discourse, and Mark and Luke end with this, he says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows. Now, when he says heaven and earth will pass away, but no one knows when that will be, I think he's referring to the end of the world. He's contrasting it. It's the, the fall of Jerusalem. Well, I can tell you when that's going to be. This generation won't pass before that happens. The end of the world, nobody but God knows that. The angels don't know. I don't know, he says. Nobody knows. Only, only the Father knows that. It's a different thing. Likewise, he gives signs to look for for the fall of Jerusalem, but he gives no signs for the end of the world. He said it'll be like the days of Noah. Before the flood came, people ate, drank, got married, bought, and sold, and they didn't know, didn't have a clue until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and took them all away. There were no signs. There was Jonah, I mean, Noah's preaching might be seen as a sign, but, but there were no, until the day that the flood came, they had no clue. They were doing the same things people do when they don't expect to die that day. Getting married, buying, selling, you know, um, doing, doing things that, that, eating and drinking. You know, if you thought you're going to die in a cataclysm later this, this evening, you might choose not to have a meal. You might choose not to follow through on your marriage plans. You might not buy anything significantly. Mm -hmm. Because you don't expect to be here more than another hour or two. What Jesus said is when the flood came, and the same thing is true of uh, Lot and leaving Sodom, is until the day the judgment came, they didn't have a clue. They're just doing all the stuff people always do when they don't expect to die that day. And there's no signs, no signs that this is going to happen. It just happens, catches them by surprise. And that's when Jesus said, you know, there's going to be two sleeping in one bed, one will be taken, another left, and so forth. 
Now, I, I understand that to be the rapture at the end of the world when I was, when I was being uh, taught it when I was younger. And I do believe this is talking about the end of the world. I believe that at this point, he's transitioned from this generation, 70 AD, to heaven and earth will pass away. No one knows when that is, but when it does happen, people will be caught totally by surprise. And one will be taken and the other left. When Jesus comes back, one will be taken and the other left. But what is it? I, I was always under the impression the Christians were taken to the rapture. And the wicked were left behind for something, for the tribulation or something else. But if you look at the passage in Luke 17, which is the parallel, or I'll make this very brief. This is where this prediction is found that Matthew, I think, uh, incorporates into his version of the Olive Discourse, but he's now talking about another subject, which transitioned by Jesus saying heaven and earth is going to pass away, but no one knows when that's going to be. He said, well, that's no good. I'm looking at Matthew wanting to read Luke. In Luke chapter 17, it says, in verse... Uh, 34, I tell you, in that night, there will be two men in one bed. One will be taken, the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. One will be taken, the other left. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Then the disciples answered and said to him, where, Lord? And he said to them, wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Or wherever the corpse is, the birds will come to eat it. Now, he's just said two people will be in very close proximity. One will be taken, the other will be left. They said, where? Where are they taken to? Well, the birds will find them, easy enough. Wherever the corpses are, there's birds. In other words, they're dead. The ones who are taken were not raptured. They're dead. And in the parallel of Matthew 24, it says, as in the days of Noah, they ate and drank and did all that stuff and did not know until the flood came and took them all away so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. One will be taken and the other left. The people who were taken away in the flood were the wicked. They weren't raptured. They were just killed. Taken away is just a euphemism for killed. And here, we have the disciples asking, where, Lord, where are they taken? Well, wherever the corpses are, there'll be birds. You really want to find them? They shouldn't be hard to find. Um, you want to find the forest fires? Look for the smoke. You want to find the dead bodies? Look for the vultures or the eagles. And what I believe he means by that is that when Jesus comes, the wicked will be judged. It says in 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 8, that when Jesus comes, he'll come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and don't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Psalm 91, it says to the righteous, a thousand will fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Only with your eyes you'll behold and see the reward of the wicked. The wicked are judged, the righteous remain. And when Jesus comes, he's going to judge the wicked and, and the righteous will be spared. But I'm not going to go into that in detail. I'm only going to say those features did not apply to 70 AD. Before 70 AD happened, all the Christians had fled from Jerusalem. There weren't righteous and unrighteous sleeping in the same bed, working at the same field. The righteous had fled across the Jordan to another mountainous area called Pella. Everyone in Jerusalem during the, the siege and the fall of Jerusalem were the wicked. There wasn't one righteous and one unrighteous in close proximity. There will be when Jesus comes back, but there wasn't in 70 AD. Furthermore, when 70 AD happened, they weren't getting married, eating and drinking. They were starving. They were starving in the siege. They were eating each other in starvation, but that's not exactly what Jesus describes. I doubt they were getting married as there was total havoc during the siege. Buying and selling, I don't think that was going on. Jesus describes people involved in peacetime activities as if they don't know they're in danger at the time that it comes. That was not the case in 70 AD. And for these reasons, I don't believe 
that the material in Luke 17, which Matthew incorporates at the end of the Olivet Discourse, I don't think that's also about 70 AD. I think there's two subjects here. And the first one is summarized by Jesus saying, this generation will not pass before all these things take place. And that was the questions the disciples asked about the destruction of Jerusalem. The other part is the future, when Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but no one knows when that's going to be. And so that could be why many people find the discourse confusing. Matthew has taken two judgment discourses of Jesus and put them together. And the, and the transition between the two is him saying, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. That's, that's when he transitions from the destruction of the temple where not one stone is left standing another to the end of the cosmos when Jesus comes back. So that's what I understand. Now, if that's new to you, and it probably is to many of you, just know it's not really new information. This view uh, was the view, well, I, I don't know about the dividing it like I did, but Eusebius, the church historian in 325 AD, quoted from the Olivet Discourse and said this was fulfilled when the Romans came and destroyed Jerusalem. So at least from the early 300s, the church recognized that Jesus was talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Uh, we may not have heard it because our teachers don't teach that view, but there's plenty of teachers that do. They're just not maybe teaching on the radio or places that you'd run into them, but it's a very early view of the church and a very uh, exegetically sound one. Now, we have a half hour. I'd be glad to take questions, either about this or about some, anything else. What's your name, James? James? Yes. Uh, you mentioned, you know, one in the field, one is gone, and one stays. Now, the way you say it, if the one is gone, is dead, and mm. the one that stays, are they Christian or are they evil? No, the ones who stay are Christian. The, the wicked are judged and the righteous are spared. I'm not surprised. That's what and we're always taught. Then, mm -hmm. The way it, 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 then the, the world was all evil, like in the time of Noah. Well, it's interesting. When Jesus said it'll be like the time of Noah, he didn't say it'll be evil. We know that the days of Noah were evil days, but that's not how he compared them. He didn't say it'll be like the days of Noah where the earth was filled with violence and the thoughts and intents of men's hearts are only evil continually. It'll be a horrible, depraved society. He could have said that. In fact, it would be almost hard to talk about the days of Noah and give examples without saying it in it. But everything he said is not, con is not bad stuff. Getting married, eating, buying, selling. These are innocent things. Mm -hmm. It's interesting where when he wants to compare it with the days of Noah, there's plenty of wicked things that were going on in the days of Noah that he could have used as examples. This is like the days of Noah. They were doing all this bad stuff. Instead, he picks stuff that people do all the time that isn't bad stuff. Same thing when he talks about Lot. He, he gives the same point in Luke 17 about Lot. For as it was in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold until Lot went out and then fire came and destroyed them all. Well, it seems like if you don't talk about the days of Lot in Sodom, you could think of a lot of nasty things about Sodom to say. He just doesn't mention any of those nasty things. He just, they ate, they drank, they bought. So, in other words, the people of Sodom and in the days before the flood in Noah's day, they were wicked people, but that's not the way it's compared. It's not compared to them in their wickedness, but in their cluelessness. So I know the worse things get, the more people want to say, oh, it's like the days of Noah. And it may be, but not in the sense that Jesus made. Jesus didn't say anything about the moral character of the days of Noah or the days of Lot when he's comparing it to the days of his coming. That's something that hard for us to read rewire our thinking about that, but it certainly would have been easy for Jesus to say, as in the days of Lot, they were, they were raping guests who were coming to their town, or as Ezekiel says, they showed no compassion on the poor and needy, and, and, uh, or in the days of Noah, they were wicked and violent. Boy, would that be an easy thing to say. And it, it'd be a hard thing to avoid saying. If you want me to tell you some things about Sodom, I can hardly find anything that's innocent that they were doing. And yet Jesus only mentions the innocent activities because the, the similarity is not in the moral character of the people of those two times. It's in the cluelessness, the fact that they were going about their lives as if nothing was going to 
changed them right up to the moment they died. So it came suddenly and without warning is what he's saying. So what I understand you saying is people that have died are dead. Uh, they're apparently evil people. Mm -hmm. The people that are alive are good people that believe in Jesus. And then the, the way the Bible talks is those times are going to be turbulent and horrible. I understand. I understand that that, that is how we've understood it. Uh, if you say that the Bible says the times before Jesus comes back are going to be horrible and turbulent, you're probably thinking of this discourse, and you're probably thinking of the book of Revelation, which is very much like this discourse. And we don't have time to get into the book of Revelation, Revelation right now, but even if the times are t turbulent and so forth, they must not be at that moment where they're buying and selling and getting married and so forth. I mean, I personally don't, I, I actually think that Jesus is predicting that things will be relatively calm and normative at the time that he comes back. He's going to surprise everybody because they're not expecting the Spanish Inquisition, you know? Yeah. It almost seems inconsequential whether or not those who are taken are judged or those who are taken carried out, unless it's uh, helping you interpret the rapture happening prior to uh, tribulation or after? Is that the implication of that? Why is that important? Either way, we know the wicked are judged. We know the righteous are preserved. Whether it's those who are taken mm -hmm. by the wicked or the righteous. What's well, the implication? Yeah, it, it may or may not be important. It's just what Jesus said. You know, okay. The idea here is to understand what Jesus was saying and what he wasn't saying. So, so there's no suggestion that they're that he's talking about anyone being raptured, but rather dying, mm -hmm. being killed, and their bodies eaten by birds. Um, just like in the days of Noah, the flood came and took them all away. Not, not the people in the ark, the people on the outside of the ark. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just that the taking of them is referred to as the taking of the wicked uh, in death, mm -hmm. not taken somewhere geographically different or in the sky or to hell. Just talk about their their judge. They they die. <clears throat> now, with regards to things becoming worse, what, what it falls uh, the letters to Timothy. You know, evil men shall grow worse and worse. In the last days, there should be perilous times. There should be lovers of themselves, and so on. Um, do you see that as applying to not just the first century, but that there was this trajectory towards you know certain things, cycles of Right. I have to say that I'm not sure when Paul talks about the last days when he's writing to Timothy, if he means the last days of the Jewish era or the last days of the, of the world. He could be talking about our future. He said wicked men will become worse and worse. And he says, it'd be, for as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, resisted Moses, so shall these evildoers, you know, oppose what is good. But it says, but they shall proceed no further than they did. There will be opposition to the gospel. There's opposition to righteousness, but they don't, the opposition doesn't succeed any more than Janus and Jambres did. Janus and Jambres are taken to be the names of Pharaoh's magicians who opposed Moses. They were successful in opposing Moses in the first plagues, but eventually they reached their limit. I think it was the biting flies that they couldn't duplicate. And, and after that, they couldn't do anything more. So when Paul says they will proceed no further, I think he means that whichever evil people in the last days he's talking about will not proceed any further than Janus and Jambres did. They, they'll, they'll oppose to the extent they can, but there'll be limits to their success. That could be the end times. You know, yes. Paul Mm -hmm. But he said, even him, that he didn't even understand it all, because he looks through a glass partly. Right. And uh, we just, we can't nail it all down. <laughs> yeah. That's what my thinking is. There are things that Paul said, when he was caught in the third heaven, he heard things he couldn't repeat. 
things unlawful for him to repeat. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be interesting? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that the things that are repeated or the things that are revealed can't be understood. I, I realize there are some things in the Bible more difficult to understand than others, and there might even be some things that in my short lifetime I won't have opportunity to fully grasp. But I don't think that anything that's written in the Bible is written there to not be understood. I think my own uh, misgivings, wrong teaching I've received, my own prejudices might make me read them without understanding them as I should. That's what I'm trying to work against, but I may not have a long enough lifetime to understand all the things that are there. But I don't intend to know everything in this life. It's not necessary that I do, but I'm not going to look at some passage of Scripture and say, I don't think I'm supposed to understand that. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's like it says in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord, but those things that he has revealed are for us and for our children that we might learn to do all the works of this law. So, so there are things that God hasn't revealed, things that were not lawful for Paul to repeat that he heard in heaven. Uh, we won't know what those are. But the things that he has revealed, that God has revealed, they are for our benefit. They are for us to at least do our best to understand. Yeah. Regarding the three, the three questions, two questions, uh, you know, you seem to be using uh, Luke and Mark as interpretive uh, lenses to interpret Matthew 24 with regard to the second question. And the, uh, the implication of that is that um, the question is not about the end of the world. It's, it's about these things in the first century. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't it possible that Matthew is actually giving more information and it might be better to interpret Luke and Mark through the lens of Matthew, especially because he actually does, in your own preaching here tonight, address the second coming. He does address the very end there using the uh, account in Luke 17 with regards to um, the coming uh, of Christ and the second coming. It is possible that Matthew rephrased the disciples' question knowing that he was intending to include information in his version of the discourse about two different events. And so he rephrased the disciples' question to accommodate both those events. So that he has them saying, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign that, of your coming and the end of the age? I certainly have considered that, and I would not be against it. It's not my opinion based on... The question is, should we let Mark and Luke interpret what Matthew has said using... Matthew uses certainly all the Hebraisms that Jesus used. He doesn't ever change them up as far as we know. Um, but we know that at least Luke changes them up at one time uh, in Matthew 20, or Luke 21, 20. We know that Luke is not averse to paraphrasing to clarify something that was a Hebraism when Jesus used it. Mark may do the same for all we know. Um, I don't know that I don't know that Matthew created new lines into the text. He may have. But I will say this, that not everyone who had Mark's gospel or Luke's gospel had a copy of Matthew's. I mean, these gospels are circulating separately around different parts of the empire. And so if someone only had Mark and Luke or Mark or Luke, they would never get the impression that the disciples were asking about anything other than these things, because that's what the subject of both their questions is there. Now, again, they don't include the material that may be re relevant to the second coming of Christ. So Matthew, simply in putting it together, may say, I'm going to include two subjects here, as if they asked about both of them. They knew it, but they didn't understand it mm -hmm. yeah. or obey it.
Yeah, it's not that love overcomes the law, but love is the summary of the law. All the law and the prophets hang on the commandment to love. Yeah, yeah. It's not an either or proposition, knowledge versus love. You can mm -hmm. have both. You can have mm -hmm. knowledge and love, and you can have knowledge without love, and you can have love without knowledge, mm -hmm. but uh, we're to grow in grace and knowledge. knowledge. And mm -hmm. so I think that's the thing. Uh, in Isaiah 34, it says, uh, leading up to this, this apocalyptic terminology of the heavens, you know, the, the, all the stars mm -hmm. and everything, you know, mm -hmm. this cataclysmic. Uh, it says, for the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, mm -hmm. okay, and uh, his fury is upon their armies. It seems to me that it's entirely uh, possible, if not likely, that these near in time local judgments. I suppose it could be taken that way. I When it talks about all the nations, mm -hmm. and it mentions Edom specifically, mm -hmm. Edom was destroyed in that general sweep against all the nations by Babylon. I mean, Babylon conquered Judah, three years later, Edom, certainly Moab and all the other nations around Syria and stuff were conquered too. So God's judgment is against all the nations, I believe, of that period of time. Now, other nations will be judged in the future, too, but I don't know that that's what Isaiah is looking at. But I, I can understand what you're suggesting. You know, it's like the Psalms. You know, you have, you're reading the Psalms about King David, and next thing you know, it's, it's about Jesus, it's about Messiah. So there's this tendency in prophecy to just telescopically just jump forward and uh -huh. then come back to cover. I would not rule that out. Well, I appreciate that. But all I can say is that it's a very commonplace set of images. Uh, most of them are found in Revelation 6. Uh, when the sixth trumpet is, or sixth uh, seal is broken, um, they're certainly referred to in uh, Acts chapter two when, when Peter's quoting uh, Joel two. Yes, and, and exactly. Yeah. Now, now on the on the, uh, the birth pains, uh, the Odin. Uh, so with Braxton Hicks, you have you know these increased. I don't know this personally, but uh, from intelligence mm -hmm. level. where the uh, Braxton Hicks are more frequent and more intense as you go through. So it seems to me uh, that these signs of, you know, earthquakes, famine, pestilence, and so on, uh, uh, very well could be increased over time and be pointing to, ultimately, uh, the very end, whereby there is, as with the Braxton Hicks, there are times where there's a lull where you have an intense birth pain and a lull, mm -hmm. very intense, and a lull, and it's entirely possible at that time, uh, just prior to the final birth pain, that there's a lull, and thus this opportunity for the days to be like the days of Noah, where they're eating and getting married and getting married. Mm -hmm. So, so um, what's your response to that? It's entirely possible. Yeah. But see, I believe that that particular statement about the birth things, though, belongs to the first subject. It's in the beginning, right. you know. So I believe it has to do with the destruction of Jerusalem. That would not mean that the same could not be true of the end of the world, but I don't think he says it on that subject, you know. Because of the um, qualifying statement of this generation shall not pass to all these things be fulfilled. That's where I see him summarizing the material, all these things, you know, which are the things that they ask. Of. The, the fact that the term these things are used in their question, and then they're used in his answer. Um, strikes me as being relevant to the particular time he had predicted that when not one stone will be left standing on another. But, you know, in saying that all these predictions were about 70 AD, 
It is not saying that similar things couldn't happen many times in history, including at the end of the world. It's just that's not what he's talking about in that section. He's not talking about any other period of time that I know of or the end of the world in that section. I think he is later on, but I don't think he is in that section myself. Just because it's it falls within the all these things kind of things that are going to happen in that generation. It's amazing how our presuppositions that we bring to the text do weigh in, hopefully not to the point where we don't allow the context you know, and uh, the teaching that's being given in a particular passage to overcome that. But I think we all have to recognize that we do bring presuppositions. The question is, you know, are those presuppositions you know, biblical and solid and trustworthy? And it's interesting to me um, that when I reconsider a particular teaching, a doctrine, a perspective, it's, it's, it's actually kind of uneasy, it's unsettling uh, to actually question the presupposition that I have. I think that's the reason why a lot of times we're not willing to go there because it's uncomfortable, uh, it's challenging, mm -hmm. it's, in some cases it, it's, it's unsettling and, and painful. Uh, but I think we're really uh, opening ourselves up to greater revelation when we're willing to really seriously question our presuppositions uh, and then we're open to then learn more. Yeah, you know, even when we think we're pretty sure of the paradigm that that we, the, the overlay that we put on passage and what it's generally about, it's still challenging to know how to interpret the details. Yeah. But once you feel like, okay, I got this. You know, I've got the paradigm down. I think these details make sense according to my paradigm. Then for someone to come say, the whole paradigm's wrong. <laughs> You got to go back to square one, start over. Think, I'm too old for this. You know, I can't start from scratch again. Yeah, that's you know challenging for sure. That's it's why threatening. Happen. Mm -hmm. Well, God should be wrong about that. What else could you? Do? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> that's the thing. I think it's it's it, we feel considerably more secure if, after many years of studying the Bible, we feel like. We've got the main contours pretty much mm -hmm. squared away. We, we, we know pretty much what most of this stuff is about, you know. And then when something maybe that's a considerable, significant aspect that we thought we understood is rattled, yeah. then we wonder, whoa, what else may be rattled, you know? <laughs> and You're still learning. I, I believe we should be lifetime learners. Mm -hmm. And we won't get it all learned. And I know, I mean, like if I... Uh, these things I was talking about tonight, mm -hmm. I began to think through in this way maybe 30 years ago. Yeah. If I was starting to think, I'm, I'm 70 next year, I, if I was starting to think about them now for the first time, I think, I don't have time. I don't have time to work through all this. You know, I don't know that I, you know, I just have to leave this for something to, for God to know. I don't think I'm going to know. But I'd still want to know whatever I could. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've come to terms a long time ago with the fact that I'm not going to understand everything in the Bible in my lifetime. Not that it can't be understood, but I'm not going to live long enough. I mean, um, frankly, it takes a lot of intensive study to see through assumptions we've had. Mm -hmm. And I don't, know, I, I don't know how much time we've got left to do that. And I do have to say that it doesn't bother me if I don't learn. That is, in other words, if I'm still wrong about something once I die, it's not the end of the world. But I would feel bad if I had decided to stop learning on purpose. You know, in other words, it's... The the What's that? I, I'm... Oh, not the end of the world, right, exactly. Yeah. I tend to agree with you. Yeah. You know, I, I, and I'm thinking, you know. Uh, well, but I will tell you this: I don't agree with the Seventh Day Adventists on on their things. Well, but I if you say, you yeah, but if that. but if you say, in heaven, those things won't matter. They would say, in heaven, what will matter is if you are obedient to God before you got to heaven, and they would say these things matter in that sense. Now, I don't think they do. 
I don't think I'm going to be judged on whether I kept the Sabbath or drank coffee or, you know, whatever or not. I don't think that'll matter. But if it was my opinion, as it is theirs, that that's really pretty important stuff to God, especially the Sabbath thing. They think that's very important. Yeah. Then, then they wouldn't accept your notion that that won't matter in heaven. They'll say that could be one of the things that matters a great deal in heaven because, because you know, the, the, the Bible indicates that he, God wants us to live in a way that pleases him in this life. Yeah, though it does say we'll be judged for our works too, and so they would they would say keeping the Sabbath is a very important work. I disagree. I don't think it is, but I think the biggest thing that's important is what Jesus told his disciples: "Go be my sheep." Yeah, and love love one another. Yeah, I think that's it. Learn some other rules of service. Amen. Any other questions, comments? You know, Macy didn't write this out this evening with her drinking of the fire hose, but <laughs> James, did you what you think? What did you get? Yeah, I'm impressed. Yeah. I'm also wondering, is it really that important to know these you know, minutia? No. No. But it's good not to have the wrong views. You know? It's it's one thing to say. I haven't made up my mind about this. It's another thing to say, I have made up my mind, but it so happens that what I've made up my mind about is wrong, you know? Not like I won't go to heaven if I have it wrong. I mean, you can have any view of Revelation you want and still go to heaven, I think. Same thing with the Olive Discourse and a lot of other prophecies and so forth. But, um, but on the other hand, the, the question is not, can I get to heaven with the wrong view? The question is, do I love the truth enough to want to have the right view? I may not, may not be able to master the information enough to know that I have the right view about everything, but am I hungry for truth? Am I hungry to know what God w wants me to, to know? And it may be, I mean, certainly an awful lot of people in heaven never had any thoughts about the, all of the discourse along the lines we're talking about, and they're doing fine <clears throat> in heaven. <laughs> so <laughs> but I yeah my my attitude at least is this that some of these things I, I probably won't understand in this life but I'm not dead yet <laughs> there's more time to learn yeah Mm -hmm. scriptural alternatives so that you don't buy into something that's totally um, misdirecting people or becoming a focus of shame. So I will say this. Understand it all to know that there's good scriptural yeah. variables. There is one practical aspect of uh, looking at this more carefully. And that is that if we decide that all of it discourse and Revelation are talking about the end of the world and it's looking really bad, then we have to adopt the view that inevitably things are just going to be horrible. It's just going to get worse and worse. There's no hope. Why should I try to change anything? Why should I try to improve society in any way? But there is hope in Christ. There's hope in Christ, right? For us. For us. <clears throat> See, I mean, that's the point. When I, there was a time I would have thought, well, there's no hope for the world, but there's hope for me and for Christians. To, well, we get to go be with the Lord. But the attitude was basically, I don't care at all about politics. I don't care at all about institutions. I don't care at all about you know, making the world a more just and righteous place. What's the point? You're just polishing the brass on a sinking ship, you know? Or as they say, arranging the deck chairs on a sinking ship on the Titanic. But... If those things are not telling us that the end of the world is just get worse and worse and worse, and if these are talking about something else, then that leaves open the possibility that when Jesus said the kingdom of God is like leaven in a lump of dough that caused the whole thing to rise, that he's predicting something more optimistic. 
And that's a principal difference between, for example, the post-millennial and the premillennial view. Not all premillennialists, but most premillennialists believe that things are going to get worse and worse and worse, and they base it largely on the Olivet Discourse and the Book of Revelation. But <clears throat> post-millennials typically don't see the Olivet Discourse, and I'm not, I'm not either, I'm neither premillennial or post-millennial, but post-millennials don't see those things as being about the end of the world. They see those as things that have happened, and they believe there's a bright future for the world in Christ through the preaching of the gospel. And they point out that the world has been made much more just in the past 2,000 years than it was in barbarian times because of the influence of the gospel. There are such things as rule of law and civil rights that are defended in societies that have been influenced by the Bible and by Christianity, which you don't find if you're in a Muslim country or a, you know, an African tribal country or something like that. You know what I mean? The gospel does improve circumstances in nations. And some might say, well, why bother if it's all going to be anyway? Well, because those nations are made up of people. And almost all people would rather live under a system of justice than a system of injustice. Um, and we are told the greatest command we've been given is what we want done to us, we should do to others. There was a generation before mine that left us the greatest freedoms and prosperity and, and, you know, best world that any people have ever known in all of history. I'm glad they did. I mean, I may be a little wimpy because of it. I might be a little bit <laughs> soft, and maybe I'd be a tougher person if I had to face what more ancient comfort. But I do appreciate the freedoms. I appreciate the comfort. I appreciate the, the hygiene and the sanitation, all the things that came because of what earlier generations, many of them Christians, did to bequeath these to me. Now, if I'm to do to others what I want done to me, shouldn't I do what I can to bequeath the best possible society, the most just and, uh, and peaceful society that I'm capable of promoting through whatever influence I have? Now, when I was younger, I would have thought, well, what's the point of that? Jesus is going to come back and like, you know, Within a, within a decade, certainly, in the last seven years, that's going to be horrible. So I'm, I'm not going to be able to leave a better world to my children. But that was 50 years ago that I was thinking that way. And now my children are grown and have children. And I'm old. And I have, my generation has left a certain kind of world to our children and grandchildren. And we didn't do as much as our predecessors did to make it a good one. Mm -hmm. And we have not done to others mm -hmm. what we appreciate that God had others do for us. And we have not, therefore, kept the great commandment. We have not loved our, the next generation as we loved ourselves. And so it seems to me Jesus might not come back in my lifetime. He might, or he might not come back for 100 years. Three or four generations may happen, maybe more than that. In the meantime, Jesus said, occupy until I come. We're supposed to be stewarding the opportunities he's given us to generate ad advantage to the kingdom of God. And where the kingdom of God is advantaged, justice, uh, liberty, Frankly, I mean, I know it sounds like American patriotic terms, but these are frankly things the Bible talks about. You know, God likes liberty. The whole Old Testament is about God delivering his people from slavery, making them a free people and telling them how to stay free and, and not go back into bondage. God gives people freedom to choose him or to reject him. Freedom is important to God. So is justice. So is righteousness. And these are things that frankly, exist in the world where Christianity has had an impact and not so much in other parts of the world. And so the question is whether we just say it's a sinking ship, why, why polish the brass? Well, maybe it'll take a few generations to sink and maybe the next generation will like some polished brass. Who knows? It might be, I mean, if, I don't know, if, if, our, if my parents' generation thought, well, 
Hitler's just the Antichrist, you can't fight it. Why not just let him take over? Let's just pray and maybe we'll be raptured out here soon. Well, we wouldn't have had the last 60 years. You know, I think of Israel. Uh, I don't know where it says in the Bible, but it says the nation that honors Israel, and I will bless them. God said that to Abraham. Mm -hmm. And I think of America, we're the richest nation ever on earth. We send more uh, people, uh, what do you call it, when they go out and preach the word? Mm -hmm. Dennis, you want to come up here and close us out? Yes. Thank you so much, Steve. Mm -hmm. What a joy to open the word. I uh, appreciate it. Let's see that here. You know, um, just to be challenged to uh, look at the scriptures in a fresh way. And the more you do something, the more you want to do it. And, and so it's just a good thing to be in the word and uh, looking at these things, in, in, like as I said, in a fresh way. So it's been a blessing. Thanks so much for hanging in there, and then I just want to say that, um, you know, to your point, James, that uh, it was Augustine, I believe, that said, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, diversity, in all things, charity. Uh, and so the thing is, just because something's not essential, so how you understand the Olivet Discourse, the minutia, isn't going to affect our salvation. Right. Doesn't mean it's not important. So there are things that are important, but that are not essential. And so it's good to look at these things and to question and to study them out to get some understanding and there are implications uh, for one's understanding of these passages so but let me just say a quick prayer Father we thank you for this time we thank you for your word and each one that's here let us uh, increase God in intimacy with you that we would uh, know you and your ways through your spirit, that we would be able to then fulfill the purposes that you've planned for us from the foundation of the world. So as we leave here tonight, we cast all our cares on you and we just uh, entrust to you any concerns that we have so we can have a good night's sleep. But let us uh, just rest in you tonight and wake up tomorrow ready to uh, fulfill those purposes to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks so much, everybody, for coming out. Amen. All right.